sermon is dedicated to all the little children who reside in paradise. I'm going to read from Isaiah. This is the second prophet named Isaiah. Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 19, and then 24 and 25. The Lord says to his prophet Isaiah, For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, nor the cry of distress. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. You know, we turn to our gospel lesson, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. Then little children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who were brought. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And he laid his hands on them and went on his way. Today's glimpse of heaven is titled God's Holy Mountain. God's Holy Mountain. <coughs> the little child woke up in the face of the stern old patch and asked, Are there dogs in heaven? Gracious, no, you foolish child. Keep you company. 
keeps leading that company. We're crazy about it. All the pets that we have had through the years have been wonderful. Members of the family. And in a town like Union Springs that displays a statue of a noble sporting dog in its town square, I suspect that old pastor's contention that there are no dogs in heaven would be considered blasphemy. Blasphemy. And you know what? I think it is. I think it is. Jesus reminds us in our call of worship this morning, Matthew 18, 3 through 4, let me read it. Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that call of worship reminds us that we must approach the kingdom of heaven as a little child if we hope to enter it. Now, Jesus doesn't mean here that those who did not join the church at an early age are not welcome in heaven. That's not at all what he's saying. Rather, Jesus is telling us that we must be childlike in our dependence upon God, our acceptance of God's promises, our obedience to God's will, if we truly are to experience the glories of heaven. So the little children in the rhythm not come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, says our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Matthew 19, 14. Jesus reminds us that it's not our self-declared wisdom, our greatness, our righteousness, that makes us fit for heaven, but rather it's God's love for us and God's grace to his children, his sinful children. That's why we celebrate Holy Communion together. A reminder of God's grace as he shared his body and his blood with us for the forgiveness of our sins. You see, we don't earn our way into heaven. Can't do it. We enter heaven in God's time because of the loving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself on the cross for our eternal salvation. We don't earn our way into heaven. No. We are given through grace entrance into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, through the grace of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. Over the past few weeks and into the next few weeks, we're studying heaven and we're seeking to understand God's glorious ultimate destiny for us by exploring images of heaven. Paradise, the kingdom of God, that are found throughout the Bible, and there are many. Last week, we examined Genesis chapter 2, and we found the Garden of Eden to be the archetype of biblical images of heaven. God created a garden of delights, a paradise, for the man and woman he had made from the dust that had given life. In God's perfect garden. He placed all manner of plants and flowers and trees and fruits and, yes, animals. Every animal of the field and every bird of the air we read in Genesis 2, 19. Well, if God gave us animals and birds as our companions in paradise, then indeed, why would we not find our beloved pets there with us when we arrive. God has promised us no more tears, nor sorrows, nor crying, nor pain in his glorious kingdom of heaven. Revelation 21.4. And 
And I, for one, believe it. I know that you do too. So when I get to hell, I'm going to rejoice like a little child in the presence of my mother and father and grandparents and family. And I'm going to embrace my loving Lord and Savior. I'm going to see him face to face. And I'm going to delight in the excited barking of my beloved dogs as they welcome me to a place of eternal bliss. And I'll be seeing you there too. Won't that be fun? Now, am I dreaming? Am I indulging in wishful thinking? Does the Bible really say there will be animals in heaven? Well, a long time ago, in the 8th century before Christ, in the land of Judah, God revealed to a prophetic poet a stunning vision of paradise. The writings of that poet were gathered, and they were cherished, and they were written on a scroll. And two centuries later, first in exile in Babylon, and then they happily returned in Jerusalem, one or more followers of the original poet added their own God-inspired images of the fulfillment of the poet's prophecies. The story was shaped to portray God's judgment of his sinful people, followed by his miraculous saving act of grace and ultimately God's restoration in the promised land, the new creation, the paradise of heaven. And thus came to be in the beautiful book of Isaiah. The theme of the book of Isaiah can be summarized in two of its most inspiring passages. Let me read them to you. First is from Isaiah 43, the first poet, the original poet Isaiah. He writes, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Then the Latin poet wrote in Isaiah 66, the fulfillment of that prophecy, as he said, For I, the Lord, am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am created. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Even now, as we see the Holy Land a battle zone, and Jerusalem a hotbed of conflict, God reminds us through the prophet Isaiah that the kingdom of heaven is coming, that God is creating it anew. The Christian apostles understood exactly what God was saying through the prophet Isaiah. Writes St. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 5.15, So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And in 2 Peter 3.13, we read, In accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is in all. And in Jesus Christ, Revelation of St. John, chapter 21, we find the fulfillment of this promise. And the one who is seated on the throne of heaven said, See, I am making all things new. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So now let us listen with ears of eager children, as we hear Isaiah's beautiful imagery of the new creation, God's holy mountain. First, we hear the words of the original 8th century B.C. poet. 
know it. In Isaiah 11, 6 through 11, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the whole wool of the ass, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now here yeah, this imagery continued in the poetry of Isaiah's 6th century B.C. As we read Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now this imagery of the poetry can be viewed as complex, I'm sure, but perhaps there's a very simple, childlike explanation. You see, there are natural enemies within the animal kingdom living peaceably together. Wolves and leopards and lions coexisting in peace with cows and sheep and oxen. We see infants and children playing with snakes. Snakes that do not harm them. We see a beautiful paradise where all creatures, great and small, are filled with the knowledge of their Creator and exhibit God's love toward one another. Isn't this a heavenly thought? And isn't this the stuff of which dreams are made? Have you ever taken a little child to the zoo? Who's taken a little child to the zoo? Anybody been along with a little child to the zoo? Well, Lane and I got to go to the big zoo uh, in Tanzania, in Africa. Huge, huge, square mounds, <coughs> beautiful animals living together. Now, those animals are not heavenly animals. They do prey upon one another. But fortunately, they didn't prey upon us. Well, if you've taken a little child to the zoo, you've seen eyes bright with delight at the sight of rare and amusing animals in play, haven't you? Mm hmm. What if there were no cages, no trenches, no bars, and we could all join with the animals in their fun? Now, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't it be great to soar with the eagles, to swim with the dolphins, to roar with the lions? Wouldn't it be fun? How delightful it would be to frolic with the elephants, play ball with the seals, and swim through the trees with the monkeys. Just think our little children would enjoy that. Swinging through the trees with the monkeys. How about this? Diving through the coral reefs without the need of a snorkel or a scuba tank and seeing tropical fish and amazing sea creatures in brilliant living color. Or try this one on your size. Bounding through the outback to kangaroos. Racing with a jaguar. Not the automobile, but a real jaguar. Laughing with the hyenas. Whoa, <coughs> you and I have heard of that. That's quite a laugh. Laughing with the hyenas or cuddling with a cute koala. A real koala. Not a little stuffed one. Buzzing with the bees, darting with the hummingbirds, floating gracefully with the butterflies, cruising the ocean to the whales, lumbering along with a giant tortoise.
or leaping through the woods with the deer. What would that be for? Or how about this, wrestling with the tigers? Or running with the wolves? Or swimming with the sharks? With never a thought of danger. What a lovely vision of God's holy mountain. Won't heaven be fun? Truly a paradise awaits. So we thank our dear Lord. We thank our Lord for the wonders he has prepared for us. Paradise. God's holy mountain. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what a wonderful paradise you have created for us. It's filled with flowers and trees and birds and animals and all the people we love. And you, dear Lord, are in our midst, teaching and laughing and playing and loving alongside us. This is the place, Savior Jesus, the eternal place you have prepared for us. Our mansion in heaven, our park, our playground, our garden. We praise your holy name, dear God, and thank you for your boundless mercy and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.